Hi, I'm Chris Ray, and welcome to the second of three video lectures about Moyen's novel Frog. I recommend that you also take a look at the brief video introduction I made to Moyen's Life and Works. In this video lecture, I want to address the form of the novel, where we have letters, we have many types of oral storytelling going on, and we also have a play at the end. So Frog is something of a three-in-one, and I want to really focus not on the play so much as on the epistolary mode that frames this novel. So if you have a novel of letters, what do these letters do? These are stories for an intended reader. We never meet the particular reader who Tadpole is addressing his letters to, but I think we do have a type of direct narratorial address and that we are kind of eavesdropping in on this conversation, albeit a one-sided conversation. I think it's quite interesting too that these letters are from China to Japan, and there is a particular film that is mentioned in the course of this novel called Tunnel Warfare. This is a film made in 1965 that has a lot of caricatured depictions of the Japanese invaders. And so why is Japan coming back? Why write a letter to Japan? And it's interesting, with Tunnel Warfare, we actually have Frog as kind of a foreign one. Bonus film! But these are personal letters, they're not open letters. It's so it's like Japan has turned from being a historical enemy into something of a confidant about very personal matters. If you look very closely at the opening letter, you'll also see there is a reference to Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre, the famous existentialist philosopher. And so why is he there? Well, for one thing, he's a playwright, and this is a novel that concludes with a play. So I want to look very briefly at some of the existentialist predicaments posed by Satra and experienced by Gugu. This novel begins with a letter. Dear Sugitani Akihito Sensei, it has been nearly a month since we said goodbye, but I can relive virtually every moment of our time together in my hometown as if it were yesterday. On the morning of the first day of the year, I accompanied you on a visit to my aunt. I am sure she left a deep impression on you. We discover as we read on through the novel that it consists of five different books, each of which begins with a letter from Tadpole to Sensei. But we mostly get just one side of the conversation. There are moments when Tadpole will say, Sensei, this is how you replied to my letter, but we don't get a lot of letters from Sensei responding to Tadpole's letters. We only hear about them. So if we were to ask what are some of the typical characteristics of letters as a form of writing, I think we could come up with a few possibilities. One is that we have first-person narration, where I am talking about my life to you, Sometimes I am saying you, 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 so it could be a second person narration. Maybe occasionally within that letter, I'll also be talking about someone else and saying they did this, they did that. So you could have second and third person narration being mixed in, but the main form is I. Letters are typically addressed to a recipient, dear so-and-so. So it's a type of writing with an implied reader. The presumption with letters typically is also that they are private, and so you can discuss personal matters, whether it's about your family, your own life, Maybe it's about some kind of confidential business thing. You're applying for a job. You still expect that it's going to be kept private. So here I'm not talking about open letters that one publishes in the newspaper. That's certainly an important genre in its own right, but it's not one that we find in this novel. A letter may be a reply or may also presume or expect a reply from someone else. Not always, but often. Another key element of the form is that letters do not have to be a set length. They can be long or they can be short. So there's a certain flexibility built into the form. One particular tone of letter writing that we find in this novel is letter writing as a type of confession or atonement. That I have done something wrong, I'm confessing this to you, I'm confiding in you about my feelings and hoping that you will forgive me. And according to Tadpole's testimony, his Japanese sensei also atones in letters for things that his family or his ancestors have done wrong. So there's a type of reciprocity built into these mutual confessions. Here we have the return of Japan, not the appearance of Japan for the first time because the Sugitani sensei who Tadpole is writing to is the son of a Sugitani whom Gugu had encountered during the war. The tone of this exchange, or at least Tadpole's half of it, is one of reconciliation, saying, you, it seems, were also a victim of the war, and your father, even though he was one of the invaders of China, seems to have also been a victim of the war too. He was going to be a doctor, a giver and preserver of life, but he ended up having to be a soldier, a taker of life. And you yourself were only a mere child when this war was going on, so you bear no responsibility for the bad things that happened. Tadpole is not denying that there were indeed cruel Japanese invaders at the time, or that atrocities were not committed. He says that they were. But he's also responding not just to a reality, but also to some fictional representations that he's come across in the past, about this type of Japanese officer who we see in movies about the war. And there's one film in particular that is mentioned in this novel, that is Tunnel Warfare, Di Dao Zhen made in 1965. We get a lot of caricatured representations of Japanese officers and their Chinese collaborators. They are menacing, threatening, but also somewhat ridiculous, and ultimately they are defeated by the Chinese populace. This is a type of stereotyped iconography that is parodied and made fun of and represented in a very farcical fashion in works like Devils on the Doorstep 
Guizhi Laila from 2000. In this novel, we have showdowns between the enforcers of the policy and the peasants who are trying to avoid it, in which we have characters as onlookers singing the theme song from that film. This is one of those films that was released in an era when people were starved for entertainment and they watched the film over and over and would learn its lyrics by heart. Tunnel Warfare is a very interesting film because it's essentially a resistance story. We also have tunneling, we have a different kind of wa, we have wa tu, we have people wa dong, like digging out caves and digging out tunnels to escape from the people who are pursuing them. But the people pursuing the peasants in the film are the invading Japanese, and the people pursuing the peasants in the novel are the domestic policy enforcers. And we get other scenes that dramatize this as well. For example, when Gugu and company are pursuing Zhang Quan's wife, they finally got her out of the house and into a boat, but she leaps out of the boat and swims away. And she hides by putting a melon rind over her head as she swims away. And finally, the melon rind is spotted and Gugu laughs and says she's using the technique the gorillas employed against the Japanese. But again, now it's being used to resist national family planning policy. So this irony is underscored in later scenes in which someone starts to manipulate and change the lyrics to the song to apply them directly to this new policy. So who is the real enemy of the people here? Prague is obviously topical in relation to the One China policy, but I think it's also topical in relation to relations between Japan and China. And in some ways it's symptomatic of a bit of a cultural shift that you see reflected in cinematic works like Zhang Yimou's Riding Alone for Thousands of Miles, in which we have this very sentimental story about a father trying to reconcile with his estranged son, but they're Japanese, and the reconciliation occurs by the father trying to complete the son's work in China. So China is the site of a family reconciliation that takes place mostly in a village. And one could point to other trends as well in commercial filmmaking, like Feng Xiaogang's film If You Are the One later became a series of films in which we have a lot of international tourism. And in If You Are the One in particular, the most striking and influential sequence takes place in Hokkaido. This film inspired many Chinese tourists to go to Hokkaido and seek to recapture some of its magic and ambiance. We have many types of foreign presence in Frog. Some of them are characters, particularly minor characters, but we also have some texts as well. In Tadpole's first letter to Sugitani Sensei, he writes, I experienced an epiphany thanks to your high praise and detailed analysis as well as your unique insights into the place of the Frenchman, Satra. I want to write. I feel I must write librettos as fine as the flies and dirty hands. These allusions to two stage plays is one that would be very easy to overlook. And in reflection, one could treat this five-part structure of the novel itself as something of a play in five acts. Satra is one of the most famous philosophers of the 20th century, a proponent and theorist of existentialism, he was not just an ivory tower figure, however. He also wrote plays, novels, biographies. He had works staged. He wrote screenplays. He was also a political activist. He is also, as Moyen is well aware, the 1964 Nobel laureate in literature. Moyen wrote Frog before he won his own Nobel Prize in Literature in 2012. Satra is famous not just for having won the Nobel, but also for having rejected it with the comment that a writer should not allow himself to be turned into an institution. And as I mentioned in my video introduction to Moyen, Moyen is also a writer who fiercely maintains independence, even though he did accept the prize. The Flies is an existentialist drama, an adaptation of the Electra myth. And I think that you could phrase this basic question as, do we create and act on our own values or on morals imposed by other people? And so you have two characters who make different decisions. Electra makes one, Orestes makes another. But they face the same dilemma when faced with Zeus, who is presented not just as the thunder and lightning god, but also the lord of the fly, so to speak. If we create catastrophe, do we have to accept responsibility for our own actions? Were these products of our free will? Do we embrace that and say, yes, I did this because I was motivated by myself? Or do we disclaim moral responsibility and say that our actions were guided by a higher power? We were essentially just following orders. In Dirty Hands, we have a political assassination. So we know who did the killing. The question is, why did this person do the killing? Did this person assassinate the target based on ideology or political principle? Or were they motivated by something more personal, like jealousy? And then if our individual actions have negative consequences that we did not attend, like the deaths of thousands of people, should we take moral responsibility for them? Should we claim them as our own? Or do we just say, I didn't mean to do that? So I think Moya makes it quite clear in the placement right up front of these two illusions that these plays are important intertexts for Frog and that both of them focus on the actions, the motivations, the voices, lives, and circumstances of individuals, as well as the consequences that those individuals experience as a result of their actions. 
And one of the effects of this type of intertextuality, and if you actually dig into these solutions, is that we begin to see that frog is indeed not just a fictionalization of historical events or epochs, like the era of the one-child policy, but that instead we have a type of dramatization of human ethical and moral problems, and a type of dramatization that uses Chinese communist family planning as its case. So one-child policy is the case, but the problems go much deeper. Still, this leaves the question, why was Satra writing about flies, and why is Moyen writing about frogs? A question we'll get to in the next video.